Good day. It's so good to be here with you again. It's hard to believe a week has, fl- uh, has gone by. It just seems to go wham, 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 really fast down that road sometimes. Just wanted to uh, remind you, as I said, probably, I think it was the last message at the introduction, that there's going to be some time here where um, our messages will be uh, simply audio recorded and instead of video recorded as I will be leaving for a few weeks. And so we're going to have those uh, sermons covering the next, uh, I think, three or four weeks after this particular message uh, on our redwateralliance.org uh, website. Just go to sermons or the sermons tab or the current sermons tab and you will find the audio uh, mp3 there for your use. Uh, Again, thank you for having me here as we continue now in in the letter to the Ephesians, uh, written by Paul from a Roman prison so very long ago. Uh, Elsie Moru, or Moru, uh, writing for LifeWire.com, discusses the ups and downs of being digitally connected. Now that's an interesting topic, isn't it? Because... It's everywhere around us. And Elsie begins with the premise, quote, social networking has changed the ways we communicate, do business, uh, get our daily news fix, and so much more. And isn't that true, folks? Then she went on to say, but is it really all it's cracked up to be? Now that's a good question. And from there she points to some of the upsides and downsides of social networking. One of the most obvious upsides, according to Elsie, is the ability to connect with people from pretty much anywhere in the world. And that's true. Can we not do that just simply with our smartphones? We have Facebook, for example. That's one of the digital platforms, among many others, where individuals or groups can connect for many different kinds of reasons, whether it's family or school reunions or interest groups. The list goes on and on. Elsie also reminds us that social networking has also impacted the business world uh, in many different ways. Many businesses succeed and are very uh, uh, profitable, if you want to put it, online, in large part because of social networks where they can sell their products and expand their reach to many markets. Well, on the downside, or as Elsie puts it, quote, the darker side of social networking, social media, uh, very evidently, can feed our confirmation biases as the algorithms are designed to fill our computers and phones with content we tend to follow and like. Here in the dark side or the social media bubble, if you will, without engaging other perspectives and opinions, the potential really exists that can lead to damaged and hurtful relationships. And this is mostly clear, evidently, absolutely in our world today in the world of teens and young adults who are trying to find their place. This peer pressure and cyberbullying, which can often lead to uh, anxiety and stress and depression as well. Well, as with many things in life, there are pros and cons also with social, uh, social networking. Now, Matt Smithurst, guest contributor for DesiringGod.org, considers the implication of the church in the digital and social media space. He makes this uh, statement, uh, quote, we live in a divided age, and that would be true too, wouldn't it? He ponders then the impact of this divided age on the unity of the church. And Smithhurst suggests that one one of the reasons churches are losing the battle, he says, to form hearts is, quote, because the Christians who visit and join and show up for worship Sunday after Sunday are battered by the storms of digital discourse. They are limping along, exhausted and distracted and confused." End quote. Well, let's go back to the days before the digital experience. Long well before, Apostle John in his gospel records Jesus and his disciples in the hours leading up to his arrest and crucifixion. And there Jesus sets a time, uh, sets a time, sets aside time, pardon me, with his disciples to prepare them for what was about to come. And chapter 17, which is often referred to as as Jesus' high high priestly prayer, 
We find Jesus there praying for his disciples, as well as those that would come after years later, including yourself and myself. Uh, there Jesus prayed in chapter 17, John 17, verse 20, 21. Jesus said and prayed that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Well, friends, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Today we're just going to begin uh, re, uh, with just the first six verses. And uh, we'll take a look at those a little closer in a moment. So please read with me. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Father, we just thank you. Thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your spirit that dwells in your church, that empowers it, that dwells in each believer, that gives us the uh, ability enlightens our minds to understand the scriptures. Help us to do that today with this particular text. And then help us to move it from our hearts and minds to our hands and feet as we serve each other and serve those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in my pre preparation for today's message, I, I put this question to my computer's search engine. What divides a church? What divides a church? And then up came 2,540,000 results. While it seems that the question of church unity is a large one indeed, at least if you go by the number of results to the question, what divides a church? You know, we could spend our time today uh, waxing eloquently on the six things that divide Christians or the five things that cause disunity in the church or eight warning signs of church division. And I'm pretty sure that there's something we can all profit from if we take some time to try and understand the impact of what Smeathurst observed. We live in a divided age, which is impacting a church today. Well, my friends, Pastor John Piper, in regard to disunity and division, said, quote, we simply must not make light of our divisions. And I would agree with him. And there, in that article, Piper is speaking of those things that divide uh, because of our unloving attitudes and actions. So when pondering what is clearly evident in our current Western Christian culture, one wonders what exactly are we going to do about disunity and division in the church? That's a, that's a great question and a, one we should consider. Piper goes on and he says something here that we can easily lose sight of. Piper said, quote, we don't create unity. Man doesn't make it happen. When we come to Christ, we are grafted in by the Spirit to one body, Jesus Christ, and members of one of another. Members of one of another. End quote. So my friends, it's to this biblical picture unity that we turn today and here in Ephesians as Paul now makes a transition in his letter to the Ephesians with the phrase here in verse 1 of chapter 4, I therefore, I therefore. Well, when we began our study of Ephesians, we began uh, stating a simple structure to Paul's letter. We said that chapter 1 to 3 is an elaboration of what God has done to form this new society, a people of God. But today, beginning with our text, Paul moves from exposition to exhortation, or as one commentator put it, quote, from what God has done to what we must be and do. So consider with me that from chapter 4, verse 1, all the way through from, to chapter 6, verse 9, Paul moves from his objective statements, those are called indicatives, in chapter 1 to 3, to the things that demand our attention and action, these are called imperatives, that well fulfill 
Paul's solemn appeal to the Ephesians to lead a life worthy or to walk in a manner of the calling which you were called. And this brings up a question, and this asks Paul, Paul, how exactly do we as this new society, as the people of God in Christ, walk in a worthy manner? Well, since you asked, here's, some, here's, some, uh, here's something for you to consider. Let's read verse 2 and 3 together. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, when we look at the context of Paul's statements around these verses, starting at verse 1 all the way to verse 5, uh, chapter 5, pardon me, and verse 16, we find two distinct characteristics of this new society formed in Christ. Of course, we don't have time to do a deep dive. We will be able to unpack more of these things as we move through chapter 4. But to the very first point of the context, the very first distinctiveness of the church is its unity. That is, the church, my friends, is one people. One people. Paul had clearly pointed out in chapter 1 and 3 that God in Christ brought the Gentiles, who were at one time far from the people of God, far from God himself, near. As Paul said to the Gentile Christians in Ephesus, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, how, how did this happen? Well, Paul would continue. God, being rich in mercy, makes us alive together with Christ. Chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. So the very first distinctive characteristic of the church that we find here in this letter is one people. There is one people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Well, the second characteristic of the new society that God has formed in Christ is why the church can manifest unity in the first place. Why? Because we are called to be holy people. Paul will go on here in chapter 4, down in verse 17, to say that you must no longer walk, you must no longer lead a life, if you will, as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their minds. And Paul exhorted the Ephesians, as he exhorts us today, to put off our old selves, chapter 4, verse 22, and to put on the new self created after the likeness, likeness of God in true righteousness. And here's the word, and holiness. Chapter 4, verse 24. So unity and purity are two distinct characteristics of the people of God. We should keep these things in mind. But there's more that could be said, but I want us now to turn back to the moral qualities of this unity that we have in Christ of this oneness in Christ that Paul was the exhorting the Ephesians to display. Notice the phrase here in verse 2, with humility and gentleness, with all humility and gentleness. Considering humility alone, it's interesting to note that in the Greco-Roman uh, ethic of Paul's day, humility was not seen as a virtue. The Latin word or Greek word, word of Paul's day meant crushed or debased or degraded. It would be used for failure and shame. You see, that culture, that society, that Greco-Roman ethic was honor was the best thing of all. Hence, the death of Christ on the Roman cross was designed to humiliate it was not seen as a virtue, yet Paul here exhorts the Ephesians to live a life of humility, a moral quality, and a manifestation of Christian unity. You know, it's without doubt that Paul had in mind the death of Christ when he said to the church at Philippi, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Philippians 2, 3. After all, Christ, Paul would say, would go on to say, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Philippians 2, verse 8. There's a time that Jesus said to his disciples, 
Uh, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's from Mark 10, 45. So, my friends, the humility that Christ displayed and that Paul exhorted the Ephesians and us to manifest today is other-centered. My friends, it's not me, myself, and I. It's the other that's important here. It's other-centered. And this is certainly a countercultural uh, 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 countercultural virtue, which is not seen as a virtue in our Western culture today, especially when you consider what Paul does here when he couples humility with gentleness, or as other translations put it, meekness. It would seem consistent within the secular worldview that gentleness is seen as weakness. Gentleness is seen as weakness. You know, that's not to say that people of all stripes from all walks of life cannot act in a gentle manner. But where God is removed, my friends, from one's life and from community, then the rabbit trail will logically lead to naturalism. And naturalism portrays this worldview that proclaims that only the strongest will survive. There's no room for gentleness in the naturalism as it is a sign of weakness. The point here is that gentleness that Paul was ascribing to, as one commentator put it, quote, was not a synonym for weakness. Another writer considering the ministry of Jesus said, quote, by following the master, one can become like him a gentle powerhouse. In other words, gentleness, my friends, is strength under control. It's setting aside our personal rights in the sight of the other. It is putting God first in all things. And of course, we see Jesus demonstrating perfect humility and gentleness when he said to the crowds, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's in Matthew 11, verse 29 to 30. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, Humility and gentleness are moral qualities that are essential to church unity. Well, moving again into our statement here in verse 2, we find, the sta- we find the phrase, with patience bearing with one another in love. With patience bearing with one another in love. Here we find the third and fourth moral quality that will manifest unity in the church. Patience, love. It's another couple here. I wonder if you're familiar with Garfield, the tabby cartoon cat. He once said, quote, I have a high tolerance level for many things ex- except stupid. I'm sure we all have had times when we were impatient with others. Maybe it's a, in a lineup at the grocery checkout or on the phone waiting in queue listening to the elevator music. My friends, we sometimes are impatient. But aren't you glad that God is patient? Here's the way God describes himself. It goes like this in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. God proclaims this. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. King David in his prayer to God said, But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalm 86, 15. Well, does this mean that God overlooks injustice? No. Does this mean that God overlooks sin? No. But he is long-suffering. And today his people who have the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit. And that means that the fruit of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life should manifest certain qualities. For example, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, gen- uh, faithfulness gentleness, self-control. I said gentleness twice, I think. That's Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So, friends, patience is long-suffering toward our brothers and sisters and even those beyond our families. 
and beyond the family of God itself. Yes, even if people are exasperating and annoying, or as Garfield put it, stupid. Please notice with me that Paul couples patience with love. My friend, unity requires patience, bearing with one another in love. Patience, bearing with one another in love. And the Apostle Paul illustrates the way of love in his first letter to the Corinthian church. And boy, did they need help there. And we see this couple together. Love is patience, he said in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patience and kind and so forth and so on. You see, for Paul, the more excellent way to live out our calling is to understand the greatest thing of all is love. Not fickle human love, my friends, but the love of God which binds everything together in perfect harmony, Colossians 3.14. Well, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Moral qualities that enhance and bring cohesion in the unity of the church. Well, going back to our starting point and Piper's comment concerning unity of church, where he said, quote, we don't create unity, man doesn't make it happen. I think Piper has a good point. Remember that Piper there is talking about the body of Christ. And it has been said before, and I think it needs to be said today, that the most dangerous challenges to the church um, is, have, <clears throat> have usually come from within the church. Therefore, it goes to reason that if this unity is going to happen in the church, it will most likely occur from within. We have an example in the early church. We find some Jews going around and teaching that all male Gentile believers were required to be circumcised in order to be saved. So it was Jesus plus circumcision, circumcision to be saved. Even the apostle Peter yielded when he refused to have lunch with uncircumcised Gentile believers. Here was a prominent and influential apostle uh, <clears throat> creating disunity in the early church by his very example. That is until fellow apostle Paul got right up in Peter's mug and called him a hypocrite. You'll find that event in Galatians. Now if Piper is right and examples abound in the church today of disunity, then the church needs, my friends, a corrective theological whack upside the head. And wouldn't you know it, Paul is right there, right up in the church's mug, where he said, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, verse 4 to 6. We see one repeated here seven times in these verses. And this is where the Ephesians and the church today, my friends, is united. It begins, my friends, with one body. And this one body is a church made up of every tribe, nation, and language. Every tribe, nation, and tongue. Paul puts it this way in Romans. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Romans 12:5. My friends, the church is one body, for there is one spirit who indwells and empowers the church. Next, we find that there is one hope that belongs to our call. One faith and one baptism, because there is one Lord. Friends, it's only Jesus. Jesus is the only name to remember. Jesus is the object of our faith, our hope, and our baptism. And now here at verse 6, we find one believing family, one new society, one people of God, for there is one God and Father of all. My friends, in a divided world where many churches are fractured, Paul said to the Ephesians, as he says to the church today, and provides that much needed in your faith, truth, and reality, where true unity is actually found. It is found with the one and only sovereign triune God, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen.
Let us pray, friends. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Oh, how inspiring and how wonderful it is to be reminded today that only Jesus binds us all together, brings us all together under the cross. We thank you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, brothers and sisters, friends, wherever you are, thank you for having me in your places. God bless. God bless you. Shalom.